Welcome to the MSME Radio Network, a division of the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network. The following program broadcast is an original creation by the broadcast entity. Discussion within the following broadcast should be used for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice or consultation. Before considering application of any broadcast content in the following program, please consult your health care provider. If you feel you are having a medical emergency, please contact your local health services for immediate assistance. MSME Media and the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network do not guarantee or warrant the accuracy of information in the broadcast to follow. The Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network provisions broadcast services to program host. Information discussed in the broadcast does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or goals of the network and are solely those of the show broadcast host. Should you wish to host a broadcast, please visit our website at msmemedia.com and submit a request to become a program host. We thank you for listening to the MSME Radio Network. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, it's Kate Milliken and I want to welcome you all to Healing Through the Story of You. This is a show that really dives into people's experiences living with MS, either directly or indirectly. We believe, um, me speaking in the royal we, of course, um, that it is possible to not only make yourself feel better, but become better as a result of emotional relatability from somebody's true life experience. And tonight, I cannot wait to share this incredible webcast with Lydia Emily, who is a totally kick-ass artist living with MS, who's not afraid to talk about what she deals with and how her life has changed um, and made things more clear as a result of her MS experience. So we recorded this in August of 2017. For those of you that don't know Lydia, go check out her work, LydiaEmily.com. And for those of you that want to get involved, want to be part of the show, want to share your own personal moments with illness to make yourself feel better or to help others, please visit MyCounterPain.com. Hi everyone, it's Kate Milliken. I am the founder of My Counterpain, and this is another My Counterpain one-on-one. -on -one. And today I am thrilled to be bringing you Lydia Emily, who is an internationally renowned artist, a cancer survivor, and an MS warrior who's been diagnosed with MS. She was diagnosed in 2011. I know, hear the audience. <sighs> uh, Lydia is also the founder of the Karma Underground, which is a nonprofit organization whose goal is to someday see a Tibet free from Chinese oppression. And Lydia, totally psyched to have you here with me now. Thank you. I, I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad you feel that way. We were lucky enough to meet um, at a conference a number of years ago, a National MS Society conference. Uh, I believe it was in Dallas, Texas. And we can talk about what you were doing there. Um, a little bit later, which included speaking and also doing an incredible mural. Um, but this, the reason why I want to talk to you on this one-on-one -on -one is the subject this week is really talking about the whole concept of embracing your bliss. And in light of you being an artist um, who's made a career out of being an artist, I'm taking the jump and making the assumption that you found a way to embrace your bliss. And I'd love for you to fill in people, the people who are watching, a little bit about your background um, professionally um, and where you've come from. And where I come from? You froze for a second. Yes, where you've come from professionally, your You're background. Still, oh, there you are. A little bit of my background and where I come from? Yes, please. At least professionally, because we're talking about you being an artist. 
Right. Well, I don't come from any place because my parents were filthy hippies and they just like kind of traveled around and every time they got a whim, they were like, oh, let's have an emu farm in New Zealand. Let's have this. Let's go to Guadalajara. So like I was raised in this environment where you kind of just uh, went to wherever your whim took you. And then when you went... Yeah, when your whim didn't work out quite as you imagined it, you were like, oh, lesson learned, no guilt, and you just went off. So um, I was uh, born in Chicago, although I haven't really spent a lot of time recently, and um, my mother was a civil rights activist. So when I was growing up, um, our life was kind of about uh, once you know, you can't know. So... Once you information the world is working, you don't just put it in your pocket to take out on Jeopardy one day. You do something about it. What are you doing about it? What are you doing to participate? Like, what is your part in life? So I was also taught that uh, everything I do, I want to be comfortable with being on the front page of the New York Times. So there was this idea Your that, obituary. Yes. <laughs> so there was this idea that, um, I mean, there was some comfort in that, that you felt like um, you were being honest with everything, but there was also a lot of discomfort that you were being watched constantly and that you had to be, you know, up, you had to be participating in life somehow. So um, <clears throat> I played in a lot of terrible punk rock bands when I was going through my rebellious youth, but I ended up caring more about drawing our album covers than I did about playing music. So that's what led me into my art life. I spent the majority of my life uh, being turned away from galleries before my career now, which is which I'm really grateful for is a good career now, but uh, I can't tell you how many galleries said to me, uh, because I only do political art, I only do social justice issues, right? And I know that's incredibly trendy right now, which I'm really grateful for, we're all very grateful for, but for 20 years, there are galleries would say things to me like, nobody wants sad Obama hanging over their couch. Nobody's gonna buy this, you know? Nobody wants Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in their living room, you know? So, um, because I didn't follow the regular path of the artist, which was to paint bare breasts and flowers, I didn't have a huge amount of work. So everything I did went out into murals in the street. Um, and um, I do appreciate, just to stop you for a second, I do appreciate the whole idea of, especially with your musical career, of having a realization that it wasn't the actual music that you loved, that it was the art from the music. Yeah, I was a terrible musician. I was a total fraud. I had, I was young and I had like blonde dreadlocks and they were like, hang a guitar on that girl. She's adorable. Like I was a complete, complete poser. I had no idea what I was doing playing. I just, I wanted to, I did all these uh, watercolors and these drawings. And I mean, this was so long ago that I would take, uh, you remember cassette tapes? Yeah. That's how long ago it was. So I I took the paper and I would draw and put glitter and and make them. And that was what I cared about. That's all I cared about. So um, I had to make peace with a long time ago that you're never going to paint exactly what somebody wants to see. You're never going to be the wife that somebody hoped they married. You're never going to be as funny as you think you are. None of those. You have to decide inside that your substance is worth everything. And once you're good with your substance, everything comes to you. And even if nothing comes to you, you're happy. Right. Is there a tip when you think about that process for you of, um, you know, realizing if you were true to yourself, (laughs) that you had to kind of buck the system? um, Is there anything in that process that got you to that comfort zone that you tangibly remember getting through like a um, gauntlet? You know what? I don't know if there was anything specific. I do remember when the tides turn. I do remember when people told me to give up. I mean, close friends, people who love me and care about me were like, stop painting uh, Hamid Karzai, if anybody out there knows who that is. Stop painting Hamid Karzai. Nobody cares about what's on They want beautiful girls. They want, you know, this is what they want. And the art world, we love you. So just, you're talented. So take that talent and do something to be able to feed your kids. And I never did it. I just never did it. And so when the climate of the world changes, which is always does, right? So we all remember disco. Anytime you doubt that what you're doing will have its moment in the sun, think of disco. Everything has its moment in the sun. Everything comes around and goes around. So when the climate started to change and people started to care about what was happening in the rest of the planet, there definitely was like a, oh, now I can pick the gallery I wanna be in. 
now I can Who was the other first pieces. figure in your art that someone responded to in this way? Do you remember the first painting you sold? Yeah, Hamid, Hamid Karzai, actually, the person I just mentioned. So I painted Hamid Karzai. He used to be the president of Afghanistan, right? So I had painted a picture of him, and Facebook had just come out at the time. So it's just him as a Facebook profile, and it said, friend request pending. Huh. And I thought that that was... I like that, cool. yeah. Thank you very much. That piece sold. So, um, so I put that one up all over the, all over the street, and then I... And I had at the time, because there was no, it, this was before of some of the social media that's happening now. I had a blog, I think, or a, something. And, um, and I got started getting letters from Africa. I started getting notes from people. And then they saw the other things I did. Like I paint a lot of people from Kenya. I paint a lot of people from Ethiopia. So they started um, that, they shared them with their friends. And so even though I wasn't getting the emotional support or accolades that I would love to have had in my own town, people that I was trying to bring some light on the ones who actually feeling it. Um, and that was, that was all I needed. That was like that, that's a tasty moment where you're like, Oh, so, so good. You know, and you just <laughs> suck oh, on it. I know, I know the creative yeah. dream, the vision of thinking, especially when you know that there's a nugget that you, you know it to be true, which is something, an expression that I really love. When you take the idea of actually um, starting with canvases um, you have since expanded your repertoire to murals. So talk to me about right. what that feels like in terms of well, the state that you're making. I did cam. I did. I was. All, I've always been an oil painter, so I was doing oil painting and canvases. I always paint on the Sunday New York Times. It's the only thing I paint on because I'm totally obsessed with Will Shorts. Even though he's gay, and he would never have me. I'm still so obsessed with how smart he is. And um, I uh, once I realized that no gout. This was like a. Uh, maybe 2001 or whatever, when I realized that no gallery was interested in showing politics, um, I just started making murals of it. And I just started, it's important for me that people know what's happening in the world. It's important for me, people to understand um, how fucking, can I curse? How fucking fortunate we are to be born in the zip code we're in. The whole idea of the mural was of every mural I did was is for A, to make your corner a play. So the same corner you pass by every day to go to work or do your laundry or whatever, that wall becomes a dance or a play or music or it changes in what way it does without changing the it architecture. It lights your brain when you walk by. And, and then the second part is to remind you how lucky you are to be born in that corner. I mean, I did murals for years of people who have been sexually trafficked. I did, you know, so there, the idea was is for you to not only to put color on your corner but was to also give you a sense of gratitude mm. for what you have and not in a way that's shaming not in a way that's like you should be grateful but in a way that's like oh maybe my walk to work isn't so bad today because i have a job because right. i have some place to live because i'm and if you can turn that around and, and and try and help people realize how lucky they are to have what little they have then maybe they'd be willing to give a little bit of it away that's right. Just and a side, little bit. side note, I think that the whole idea of gratitude and perspective um, from a health perspective is healing, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so you have the been- The minute you get into self-pity, uh, the minute your, Seinf your Seinfeld episode becomes real and not just a joke, the minute your self-loathing becomes uh, introspective and sad and dark and it's not just a jokey thing, it's game over. It's game over because not only- do you not want to help yourself, but no one's going to want to help you. That's and, right. it, follows and you, it follows you around like a storm cloud. Yeah, you isolate. And people don't think that they come off looking like the snuffleupagus or uh, what was his name? The guy who touched everything in the Flintstones. And, you know, uh, anyways, like a, people don't think that they see that, but it's the, it, you're giving up on yourself and your sickness is the same. You, uh, I use this a lot. It's the same thing as the desperate girl in the speed dating room. Hmm. She doesn't think she looks desperate, but everybody can smell it and no one's going to her table. And it's the <laughs> right. same thing when you're sick and you're like, woe is me. You have that smell of, of, of that you've just given up. And if you've given up on yourself, it's really easy for other people to give up on you. I think that there's a moment in the illness journey. I am living with MS myself, but certainly you've had two, cancer and MS, um, where I think it's fair to allow yourself to grieve to come to terms of having something be different. But at some point, I think there is an opportunity for a conscious decision. Well, yeah, I mean, what, 
the way I handle it, the way I handle the fact that I had um, cancer and that I was born with a bad heart and that I was born with a deformed uterus and wasn't able to, you know, really have children easily and then had the cancer and now have the MS is that I, mean, um, I have it so you don't have to. So my girlfriends, my amazing group of circle of friends, right? And, and guy friends, I have like maybe 20 people in the inner circle that, and we we're all satellites around each other, had them for years and years and years. Statistically, one of those women was going to have MS. Mm. One of those women was going to have cancer. One of those women was going to get raped. Statistically, each one, and it, this is not a gender thing. Don't, I, I'm just, I just said woman because I said woman, but statistically, each one of those people was going to experience something. So I took it. I, the only way I can feel good about owning this is by making it my choice. I'm hugely impressed by the whole idea of, of deciding to put your work in a larger mural space to give perspective. And speaking of perspective, I want to know what it's like for you as someone who had built your career um, painting and characterizing political figures. You know, one of the things you've done in the past few years is actually making murals on behalf of MS or with people with MS. Right. And I'm curious for you of what that experience is like to do it for the cause that you're part of and also uh, how the perspective is for you with the people living with MS who are part of it. Um, let me think about this answer. I think that with every mural project I take on, I meet the most amazing people, the, the uh, medical community certainly starts off far, far more grateful when I do murals in neighborhoods that I think really need them. Sometimes that community gets a little bent. Now, by the end of the mural, they're always very grateful and very happy, but especially in less served communities, you have a very suspicious community. They're not quite sure why I'm there, but I tend to win them over when I'm addressing just their needs and just their culture, and I'm not making it about me at all. I won't even sign it half the time. Um, are you still there? Yes. I just got okay, unstable. It says I know I saw it too. Don't worry. Yes, yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, the MS community, I think that when I was doing those larger ones, like the one I did in... You can just put it on the counter, sweetheart. That's my daughter. All right. Let's when, just um, have you do a pickup. So when I was doing those... Uh, when, I was in a, when I was in Portland, Oregon, and I did a mural that was three stories for the MS society there, I mean, people, when they come out, um, and they were just wanted to write their name on it. They just wanted to be a part of it. That, that was really remarkable. Cause I don't, I haven't had in any other series of murals I've done, I haven't had people come and write their names because a lot of times I'm doing murals about uh, people who've been displaced, refugees, sex trafficking victims. So they don't necessarily want to write their names on it. They want to be involved and they want to feel the love of it, but they don't want to be documented in any way, which is completely understandable. So right. for the MS, uh, it was the fact that you gave kind of a vehicle for people to not be afraid to showcase and stand up for the right. fact. Right. They were able to come out and they're, and a lot of times their hands were too, you know how we get, their hands are too shaky. So we helped them. And each one of those people, I mean, I still talk to almost everybody who's come to all those. And what's so interesting is uh, we did one in downtown Los Angeles and recently a, gra uh, a graffiti artist had covered all of it. And the response, I mean, usually when you do a mural, you're like, it's in the street, that's organic. That's what happens, a tree grows over it, grass grows over it. Like you don't get to keep stuff in the street forever, but the community came out and was very upset and repainted it wow. and repainted it. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. Yeah. So I'm really, I was really grateful. I did one in Austin, one in Louisville, Kentucky, if I'm pronouncing that right, Louisville. Louisville. Um, they're very serious about that, very serious about the pronunciation of their town. Um, Austin, Louisville, um, Portland, Oregon. We did Dallas. We did Los Angeles. And had my health allowed it, I would have done more. Although I think the ones we have are really wonderful. And then we did um, a backdrop for the National MS Society to use on T-shirts or whatever kind of sure. swag they want to do. And so that people can continue to write their name. Sure. And then those can come down and those can be folded up and sent around. And um how is the your, whole, how the is, your... is to not be shamed by it. You know, there's this idea that when you get MS, you're just, that's it. You're in a wheelchair and your life is over. And it's not true. It's just not true. And I know people who don't have MS and who are in wheelchairs and are killing it. They're right. killing life that's every right. day. 
whether you're in a wheelchair or not with MS, um, that over and over, it sounds like we've both been lucky enough to see people who kill it regardless. Yeah, they're killing it. That's all you have to do is kill it. That's it. You get so little time. We get so little time, regardless of whether we're sick or not. I've worked with kids in schools doing free art classes who have never seen the ocean and they live in Los Angeles in some of these areas I'm talking about. They're maybe 11 miles from the Pacific, 11 miles from the beach, from Santa Monica, from Venice, pick anything that's on the West Coast. 11 miles, 18 years old, never seen it, never got on the bus to go see it. MS isn't stopping them. It's not all about how sick we are. It's about what we're doing to live, what we're doing to enjoy every single moment. Talk you know to I mean? me about that as you made the jump from the beginning of your career, knowing that you wanted to do a, an art that didn't fit into a conventional sphere. Talk to me about that moment in between knowing knowing who you are and knowing where your bliss is, how to get there. For people who are listening here with MS, who are thinking, gosh, maybe my life could be better. Maybe I oh my could try to do this. How do you get them there? I mean, I, would, I hate to give this advice out, but be reckless. Life is so short. Don't plan out everything. Don't plan out every meal. Don't plan out your diet. Don't just have days off where you do something so reckless. And then find that what worked for me so well is I found that one thing that I didn't want in me anymore. So I had this, I had a girlfriend give me this advice. So praise to Jen who did this. She told me to take a picture of myself when I was a little kid. And there's not a lot of those because again, hippie parents and they probably right. smoked them. But so I found this picture of me when I was in the second grade or whatever. She's like, put that in your wallet. And I was like, okay. And so I put it in my wallet. And she said, now, every time you make a decision, you make it for that girl. Yeah. What does she want? Look at that baby's face and say, does she, should she smoke two packs of cigarettes today? Should she drink tonight? Should she run? Should she uh, go out on a date with that jerky guy again? Should she uh, go plan a trip with whatever? What, what are the things that you would do for that kid? And yeah. so that's what I did. I carried this picture around. And that's when I got into uh, finding my substance. Because when you try to explain to that picture that, I don't know, pick something people will hate me for this, but pick something ridiculous like breast implants, which makes me so angry when you, and not for cancer survivors, for people without substance. I know women who've spent forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on breast implants, and do you know what they are? They're still sad. They're still suffering with that depression because that those these things that we put all over ourselves, not even my tattoos, none of these things change my substance. So I had to find a point where I, you know, I had lost my left eye recently to MS, and so instead of getting a $40,000 breast to put over it or something that would make it beautiful, my girls and I went to a, a party city and we got a slutty pirate costume and we got this ridiculous <laughs> eye patch that makes me look like a pirate and my daughter sewed it into a heart and I was like, I'm going to own this. This is going to become fun because I don't have a choice. And the only way for me to be able to live with these things that have happened to me and, and make them amazing is to own them. There is no, this is my sad eye patch. And no, I find the best, most awesome eye patch. When my foot is dropped and I can't walk, I make it funny. I'm like, check out, check out how drunk I am. Or my sense of humor has gotten me through everything. And my sense of substance that knowing that nothing that I put on me changes who I am and what I want and what that little girl in that picture deserves. Right. Changes I, the entire outlook. What I love about that too is I think that there is enormous power in the whole idea of childlike wonder. Right? Oh, so yeah. In our best, day, right? yeah. Well, because I think everybody has a lot of things going on, no matter who they are and the reality of it. You know, recently I had the opportunity of going to trapeze school and I got put into oh, it. I'm so jealous. That's awesome. Oh, and in that moment of flying and being caught, I thought, wow, why don't I do this more often? Why don't I stand on a platform where I'm scared shitless and oh listen to somebody so and try something new um, and how that can open yourself to progress? For you, oh, yeah. What do you be reckless? That's my be, advice. Exactly. I mean, don't be reckless, like go to Vegas and get weird diseases, but I mean, like, but be let go. Call, Dude, yeah, go like, to Vegas, use birth control, don't get the disease. And not that pop. pill, the plastic. Right, no. right. Exactly. So, um, how have you? I know that certainly um, you have a documentary that I'd love for you to tell us about uh, where it is, um, but certainly seeing the trailer. 
um, I saw some footage of you painting with MS and that actually MS has um, given you some challenges in terms of debilitation with your hand. Yeah. How yeah. has it been the problem and with how the... has it changed your art? What? How has it been and how has it changed your art? Well, um, I have to wear the eye patch now when I paint. From far away, like I can look into this camera and talk to you and things aren't so bad because of this eye being gone. But when I get really close, when things need high detail, I need to wear my patch, which is a bummer because actually eye patches make your eyes sweat. Nobody talks about that. Mm -hmm. I had no idea my eyelid could sweat, but it does. Wow, congratulations. Um, when I get, the problem with uh, my mural doing, which is why I've cut back on it, I'm focusing more on in-gallery uh, oil painting, is that murals are the easiest done in the summer. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to do murals in the spring and fall because there's rain and that makes the paint drip and you have to take all these breaks and you have to pay your crew while you're taking breaks. So, um, And being outside in that heat, as you know, somebody with MS is kids to death. So... Um, to conserve energy sometimes. I will tie the brushes to my hands because it makes it much easier. I just, it's its not that I can't hold the brush because I can, but after a while those muscles get tired holding things, you know? So when you wrap the brush around you, you don't have to expend as much energy. I'm all about cutting corners with energy, trying to find ways around Hopper. Oh, Hopper is what my kids call MS. There was Ooh. this old show called Bugs Life and the main bad bug was a grasshopper and he would jump around and bite people and that's what my MS feels like sometimes so they they always say is Hopper back when I'm mm. feeling bad mm. yeah so we don't like Hopper he's a dick anyways and he's so bossy MS is so bossy like whatever um so um I do that I definitely have to take more breaks I'm actually going I'm renting a cabin up in the mountains for the next year so that I can work on my next solo show where it's where I don't have to even manage air conditioning, where it'll be under 80 degrees all the time and I can just focus on work and I won't have to battle Hopper. I don't, I, I want, I want Hopper to be in the most successful situation possible, you know? Yes, and um, the, the film right now, PC594, is um, in editing. A documentary so, um, about you. The, I'm sorry, the documentary, yeah, done by Blueprint Films um, is in editing. So they have a PC594, thefilm.com or PC594.com that people can go and see the trailer if they like. Um, and um, we hope it'll be out next year. So it's really exciting. I mean, my whole goal in that was to be able to be, you know, when you get diagnosed with anything, cancer, MS, anything, there's this like these sad groups you go to and everybody's sad and they talk about how sad they are and I just wanted there to be almost a Jerry Lewis version of a blonde Jerry Lewis MS thing that would make it you know that the only way to take the tragedy out of the Greek play is to change it 